This is Lisa from This Jungian Life. We're excited to announce the launch of This Jungian Life Learning, an online educational platform that offers a chance to dive into Jungian topics more deeply. Our first offering will be a 12-month program called Dream School. The three of us will guide you in learning how to interpret your dreams so that you can learn the language of the unconscious. Jung said, in each of us there is another whom we do not know. He speaks to us in dreams and tells us how differently he sees us from the way we see ourselves. Learning to work with our dreams can help us hear the perspective of this other, leading to an abiding sense of aliveness, renewed creativity, and greater psychological wholeness. Dream work can help us resolve inner conflicts, shift how we approach interpersonal relationships, and help us to find our authentic ground. We're hoping to launch Dream School later on this summer. If you'd like to be one of the first to hear about it, please go to our website, thisjungianlife.com, and click on the banner link at the top to sign up for our email newsletter. Thank you. Welcome to this Jungian Life Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. As we were musing over our topic today, I brought forward a particularly intense experience that I've been having with my clients. That as people are talking about the decision to wear a mask to protect themselves from a COVID infection or not, or that conversation in the general political sphere, I began to realize that aside from the medical advice around wearing a mask, people have intense feelings that have accumulated around those who do or don't wear a mask. What's clear is that the archetype of the mask has been evoked in a way that's unprecedented in modern culture. Masks have an ancient heritage and have served many, many different purposes. They ring through the collective conscious on many different levels. And what we know as unions is that while we are coming into a modern relationship with an object like a surgical mask in the grocery store, the ancient part of our psyches also light up with all of these many different levels of feeling and acknowledgement. And that, we believe, is informing the intensity debate around wearing a mask. Right. So there are archetypal energies unloosed in this conversation that we're not even really aware of, but it's adding heat and charge perhaps to this discussion. And when archetypes are activated, we know that our little human personalities are being swept by currents that are really powerful and add levels of meaning that may not be visible or inherent in the actual outer situation. Uh, this is um, such a great example, uh, the mask in today's culture because of COVID, of what I think of as a tap root that goes way, way down across cultures and through time into something that is so deep and inherent in the human psyche that, as you said, we're not aware of it consciously. But archetypally, masks are as old as human beings are. There's a stone mask that was carved 7,000 years ago. A lot of ancient masks were probably made of leather or cloth and have not withstood the decay of time. Uh, there are cave paintings from 
30,000 years ago in the caves of Lascaux of people wearing with bird heads, which are um, assumed to be masks. So we have this mask thing deep in our psychic DNA, whether we know it or not. Yes. So masks are universal and they're archetypal. And the idea of the mask speaks to us at a deep, deep level and has many layers of meaning. So one of the qualities that we have some information about is that in the shamanic world, wearing a mask evoked the spirit of something into the one who was wearing the mask. So if one was participating in a ritual dance and one was wearing a bear mask, for instance, there was a very strong archetypal identification with the spirit of bear that would inform the sounds and the movement and the expectations about what that energy could provide for the individual and for the tribe as a whole. I think we see that today, too, when kids wear masks for Halloween, that it's not as if uh, that child is pretending to be a lion or a bear or some action figure. That child is the lion, the bear, Batman, you know, whoever that kid wants to be. So even today, we see it in kids of how masks enable us at like a bridge to inhabit the archetypal and symbolic imaginal world. Yeah, I mean, I think donning a mask kind of temporarily erases the personal kind of small personality sense of ourselves and lifts us up or puts us in touch with something that is more archetypal. We have an instinct around this and we really enjoy it. I remember being a kid and having a mask and going out as Frankenstein and, and stalking around with my arms in front of me and making growling noises and really feeling in that theatrical way that I had come in contact with something that was incredibly wondrous and different from myself. And this is why masks found their way as an important part of Greek theater. The great theaters of Dionysus, the use of masks, were practical in one sense because there were upwards of 15,000 people that could be in these enormous things. And being so far away, something very, very large and structured, allowed the audience to have an expectation of this character, but it was also part of the religious feeling that the plays themselves were full of tremendous archetypal themes that informed the psychology of the culture. So masks become a conduit for relating to transcendental energies. They are a way to lift us out of the personal and kind of connect us with the gods, the ancestors. Yeah, it's these archetypal and instinctual energies uh, related to gods and related to animals. They allow us to do things we wouldn't normally do because after all now, you know, I'm wearing my wolf mask, so I am allowed to act in wolf-like ways. They put us in touch in the best sense with those aspects of ourselves uh, that our sort of civilized personas don't allow us to, to really enact or inhabit in a way and look out at the world through this mask of of the wolf or the bear. But they also allow us to look in and be in touch with something deep within us. I'm so taken with how the mask mediates the inner and the outer world, the instinctual and the archetypal or transcendental transcendental world, this mediating, bridging function that it serves. And if you think about it, masks have two sides, right? There's the portion of the mask that Mm -hmm. faced out into the world, and then there's the inside of your mask. I'm thinking as we're talking about how this arcane understanding shows up in modern culture. 
Lisa, you had mentioned when we were chatting about that Jim Carrey movie, The Mask, which is uh, was done up in 1994. And in that movie, Carrey comes into possession of some strange green wooden mask. And when he playfully just puts it in front of his face, just to see what that's like in an almost childlike innocence, the mask attaches to him. And then he's possessed by the spirit of Loki and has all these extraordinary powers, but also is wildly mischievous. And as Loki was in mythology, pretty destructive <laughs> as well. Yeah. So there's this idea that, that it gives us the, the mask has almost a magical power that confers uh, a special status on the wearer. And in that story, there's a bit of a morality tale because the mask eventually possesses him. And the second half of the movie is, how do I get the mask off? How do I get the mask away from me? Because the archetypal forces are too much to bear. So that's uh, such an interesting theme of being possessed by an archetypal image. And I wonder how we see that uh, manifesting in today's world, sort of riffing on the Jim Car Carey character of uh, in social situations, do we become possessed by the images that we put on socially, maybe not as literally as a face mask, but those images idealized or demonized images of ourselves uh, that we get over attached to and perhaps possessed by. I remember reading a biography years ago about Marilyn Monroe, and there was a story told by one of her friends, if I'm remembering correctly. They were just walking down the street, socializing the way they had for many years. And Marilyn Monroe, who I believe her name was Norma, Norma Real Jean. Norma Jean. You know, was just talking about this switch that she could flip in her personality and that they could walk down the street in her normal mask and no one would even recognize her. So she told her friend, just watch this. She took a few steps away and then lit up the mask of Marilyn Monroe. Mm. And then people just turned and recognized her and started flocking around her as she put on this mask, which carried the enormous archetypal power of Aphrodite. Yeah. I mean, I think we're, we're reaching into right now, which we knew we would eventually, <laughs> th this idea of this Jungian idea of persona. This was the term that Jung coined, and he picked the word that goes back to the Greek uh, through the Latin for mask that relates to the mask that the tragedians wore in ancient Greece. And it's a social role that we put on and we might have, ideally we have several personas. We have, you know, we're one way with at our college reunion where we act a different way at work. We might act another way with the guys we play poker with. Uh, so we have, several personas that we can kind of take on and uh, put off. Yeah. It's uh, so interesting what you've said about, it's about how we adapt uh, to the culture, uh, the culture of college reunion versus the culture of the workplace and that it should be flexible. And uh, if it, I like the putting it on and taking it off because it relates it to the physical nature of a mask. I know the persona I should adapt when I'm going into the office uh, versus uh, what I might have at a party. But that the danger is over-identifying with the persona or, or not having enough of a persona. Both of those polarities can get us into trouble. Yes, I can think of a number of times when someone's come in for analysis and I think empty nest syndrome brings this forward, where mom has taken care of the kids, you know, for 18 years, maybe 20 years. The last one has finally gone off to college, and the role of being mom has been so powerful that without the staging of being a mom, i.e. having all the kids running around the house, her sense of what her role is or what her persona is 
starts to collapse and then there's a crisis of identity in as much as she may discover that she thought that's all she was. Oh, I just can't relate to that at all. <laughs> <laughs> and then what could happen if I take your example, um, the next step is, uh, let's say that this mom has a real sort of uh, life crisis and comes into therapy. Very often part of therapy is the dissolution of persona of those things that the culture may have mandated that the person took on, and maybe things in the person's own psyche that became perhaps over-identified with, but that the dissolution of the persona is uh, in service of finding a, a different, more solid, underlying sense of self that is uh, within rather than one that may have perhaps been imposed by family and other cultural forces. So we're talking about the way that our personas are a kind of mask that we wear as we move through the world in service to adaptation. One of the things that I'm finding interesting about our conversation in this part is uh, we're circling around something that I think is largely true is that many of our masks, our social personas, have an archetypal core. As you were saying earlier, Joseph, about the Marilyn Monroe mask, which is so enlivened with the power of Aphrodite or the kind of persona of being mom, which grabs up into it the archetype of the great mother. Mm -hmm. So these can be very, very powerful and even though they are a social role that helps us adapt to the outer world because of their archetypal content, they can really exert a powerful force on the personality. That kind of goes back to the Jim Carrey movie. Like, be careful what mask you 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 don because it may have a real impact on the functioning of your psyche. I'm thinking about how uh, the persona of Katniss in the Hunger Games with her bow and arrow and her heroic stance has the archetypal root of, of Diana, uh, the, the huntress uh, who never married and was independent with her hunting instinct. So all of these kinds of images, uh, just as we're saying, go very, very deep. So they can be very abstract as in psychological masks or patterns of behavior that are predictable, and therefore they become ossified and in a way mask-like, all the way down through the levels to concrete masks that people collect or wear, whether it's children's masks for Halloween or ancient tribal artifacts that are part of religious practices. But they all have a deep taproot, as you said, Deb, into something a priori, something eternal, and Deb, I love to quote that you had mentioned when we were prepping for the session. I think it's a Joseph Campbell quote, that a mask is a temporary housing for the God, mm. which I thought was just an incredible way of just summarizing that the way that our masks are tapped into something eternal. And because of that, they are really potent. And, and I want to lift up something about this, about this temporary housing for the God and what it's like to be the wearer of a mask or someone perceiving someone wearing a mask, which is um, that it can, it can unleash dark forces as well. So it's a trope in horror movies, although I'm not a big fan of horror movies, that the the bad guy has a mask, you know, like a clown mask or a ski mask or right. That's in a lot of these horror movies. And it's a signal of danger. You see someone, I mean, I was joking with some friends because it used to be if you were, you know, walking alone down a dark street and you saw a guy coming toward you with a mask on, you'd be really freaked out. But these days with COVID, you're like, oh, great, he's wearing a mask. <laughs> but, but usually it is a, a signal of, of danger because that person has been allowed to disidentify from their social persona, from their social role. They are anonymized and, and therefore they can now have access to these darker energies. It's like what you were saying, Deb, about, you know, the little boy who's wearing his wolf mask and he gets to act like a wolf, but this, this really happens. 
right? That sometimes sure. people, when they want to make mischief or be intimidating, you put on a mask, you mask your face, you mask your face to commit crimes. Yep. And every uh, maker of a Western movie knows this very well. The bank robbers and the train robbers wear masks. And then there are those sort of ski mask balaclava things that signal this is a bad guy. Mm -hmm. So the mask there is protecting their identity from exposure and repercussions. And being free of repercussions can allow the shadow to come out at times. Yes. Yes. It's like permission for the shadow to come out. So if a mask is a temporary housing for the gods, beneficent gods can be summoned. And so can malevolent gods mm. be kind of channeled through this masking. And I also want to lift up that we have this uh, dividing line between physical concrete masks from those that people are wearing during COVID to bank robber masks, to wolf masks, ancient masks. And we have the psychological mask that our persona provides us with that you alluded to very graphically, um, Joseph, with your Marilyn Monroe reference, that it's a more subtle kind of mask uh, that we clothe ourselves in as an adaptation to culture, but it too has archetypal roots and can uh, possess us or run our lives for us. So continuing to circle around this seductive aspect of masks to hide behind. I was just thinking about all of my childhood comic books and reading about Batman, who his day-to-day -day personality was this, you know, groomed philanthropist mm -hmm. and multimillionaire of Bruce Wayne. But born out of a childhood trauma, he dons the face of the bat <laughs> and then has permission to be a frankly, a murderous vigilante. Mm -hmm. He was always one of my favorites, uh, together with Spider-Man. Uh, we never know who he is either. So here are people that need to be masked, uh, in Batman's case, as sort of a dark, transgressive, law-unto-himself figure uh, in order to do good, ostensibly it was necessary to hide his true identity. But I'm thinking about lots of other ways, too, that uh, we put masks on in our culture to hide ourselves with sunglasses. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in when I grew up, uh, facial hair on men was a real no-no. And every now and then I saw someone with a mustache. But these days, beards and facial hair are all kinds of things that can be done to style one's face, as it were, not to mention makeup. I remember my grandmother, um, when she would go to, before she would go to work, and she worked at night as a telephone operator in the Roosevelt <laughs> Hotel in New York, and she would talk about, you know, putting her face on. And of course, I was a child. She put this, you know, tremendous thick coat of oh. pancake on her face, and she'd, you know, take this big, bright red waxy lipstick on and big, bright rouge on. And, uh, you know, it was this extraordinary transformation into, uh, for herself, maybe looking younger uh, or being being acceptable in some social mm -hmm. uh, situation. I think there was a time when going out of the house without makeup was considered transgressive. Where this is taking me is we've talked a lot about how the mask helps us relate to the symbolic world uh, and, and lets us access these deeper energies. But I'm also thinking what we're talking about now is um, how we relate to each other and how the mask helps us mediate those relationships, which is a little bit like persona, because when we're wearing a mask, we have this opportunity to be disidentified from, you know, from who we are socially. And we're sort of thrown back in on ourselves then. And we may have the opportunity in that instance to, in essence, be more authentic because we're not constantly giving off signals to other people. So we don't have to worry about the social 
implications of our facial expressions, for example. So it, it isolates us in ourself in a way that mm-hmm. can give us deeper access. Yeah, we get disidentified with our usual person, quote, personality, unquote, and that that may uh, definitely give us access to something bigger, deeper, more universal as a human uh, wellspring. I didn't know this until I did some research for this episode, but some acting schools will have the actors rehearse in neutral masks. Um, as a way to uh, kind of turn inward more and access something that feels more authentic. So it's interesting in a way, isn't it, that uh, this thing that we put on as a mask over our face, uh, sometimes very literally and certainly psychologically as our persona, can paradoxically give us access to something in our depths. Yes. and then. Perhaps pivoting to some more modern considerations, the conversation that is really big in the culture right now is masks that protect us. Mm -hmm. Deb, you had brought up some medieval associations with protective masks. Uh, During the plague, uh, people wore masks that had beaks and they would put herbs in the beak. The theory sometimes was something about bad air or the miasma. Uh, Sea air especially was supposed to be bad. And, of course, cities could smell pretty rank. Uh, So that was a kind of of protection. And then uh, sometime in the mid to late 19th century, germ theory came in. And so doctors and particularly surgeons uh, started wearing masks to protect uh, themselves and protect their patient uh, from the invisible world, uh, the invisible world of germs and microbes. And uh, certainly we see that today during our COVID era. So masks used to help us relate to the invisible world of the archetypes, and now they mediate our relationship with the invisible world of the microbes and and signal our domination or at least our attempted domination over that world. Mm, I think that's that's right on. Uh, similar to that, you know, the World War II gas masks even mm-hmm. these invisible gases that could be so horrific and one needed a filtering chamber to make sure they were safe. And as a kid, I was fascinated with diving masks. Um, and scuba diving and the whole idea that you could have this mask that allowed you to breathe underwater just uh, seemed unbelievable. And again, protective, mm-hmm. you know, providing a rarefied environment where you could remain safe while you're looking out on the world that ha- was potentially dangerous. So this may bring us to this very vibrant discussion about wearing or not wearing surgical masks or other kinds of masks relative to the medical recommendations around the COVID epidemic. And this has come up very potently for me with certain client conversations where people are not simply saying that they do or don't align with medical advice, but, you know, wearing a mask, you know, is a sign of both compliance or maybe even benevolence or kindness and not wearing a mask for some people can be associated with a sense of radical freedom and uh, refusing to be tethered or trapped. And all of these other meanings have accreted around the idea of wearing a COVID protective mask that I think has its taproot in all the stuff we'd been saying before. And it seems to also be, um, linked to kind of the diversity of of cultural norms and values you know across our country so we see our the diversity here of of values in different areas of where it's the norm that everybody will wear a mask i'm on cape cod and everybody does wear masks uh and other areas of the country that seem to me to value individuality much more of, you know, I'm an American, you can't make me, or a what may be kind of a heroic stance 
of uh, I'm not afraid of, uh, you know, this invisible virus? Or is it a heroic stance to wear a mask? Let's break it down into those two camps and, and see, you know, what are some of the values that we're hearing accreting around what really is objectively just a medical decision and perhaps even a rational decision. So what I hear in the pro-mask advocacy is that wearing a mask is associated with a virtue. And that's a very powerful assignation to that decision because then, of course, it implies that people that are not wearing masks lack virtue. And that is a powerful polarization at the level of feeling. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if it goes to also the issue of sort of individual expression, freedom and rights versus collective norms and places where we all sort of have to acquiesce. Uh, Is it a difference between uh, I and leaning toward that end of the polarity versus we? And uh, that we are all the same in wearing masks uh, together. Here, there are all kinds of signs on people's front lawns of we're in this together. Uh, So the communal collective norm versus room for individual freedom and expression. And, of course, there's room for individual expression in the type of mask that is worn. People buy designer masks. Uh, Kids wear masks with animal faces on them. Uh, Some people wear bandanas, you know, that uh, can be pulled up or worn around the neck, uh, depending on where they are. But And there's a whole market, um, as Amazon will tell you in a nanosecond, for buying all kinds of masks, the N95 masks and masks with all kinds of filters. It's, um, it's a huge range here. So in that way, I think you're mentioning, Deb, that the mask itself has become a, a palette for a whole <laughs> spectrum of aesthetics. And I think you were mentioning that um, the pro-mask community is assigning it communal values and perhaps the those who are against wearing masks are perhaps identified with a, a singular sense of I and individuality. Yeah. And that's a polarity that we struggle with all the time uh, in families, uh, in communities, uh, nationally, is how much of it is I and how much of it is uh, a collective value or norm that's established for any reason. Another archetypal lens I would put in that same thing has to do with the value of the mother versus the hero, which actually have a natural tension. The hero for Jung often separating out from the maternal enmeshment. But in the pro-mask community, a lot of the maternal values of protecting, loving each other, were, were bound together are are really woven into the story of wearing the mask. And I think what we're hearing on the other side of the polarity is a more heroic anti-maternal stance of, you know, I'm facing the dragon, you know, by myself, and, you know, I'm full of heroic vigor and confidence and don't need any of these kind of... uh, what maternal accommodations or childlike accommodations from that view stand. So we really can see uh, in this COVID thing uh, and the differences around masks, uh, what happens when a symbol gets activated? People might not know it consciously, but wearing a mask or not wearing a mask and what kind of mask you select uh, really goes deep. We're reacting to mask as symbol and what it means to me. I think some of the stuff that we were talking about earlier about masks generally also applies here because I think that there are ways that when we wear a mask, that might affect 
our sense of self as we go out into the world, that we're communicating something when we put on a mask, whether it's, you know, that we uh, are virtuous or we're going to adhere to the advice of uh, authority or, or whatever it is that we're communicating. But also, I feel I find that it does change interaction with people, right? When you're wearing a mask and the other person's wearing a mask. Um, you know, I talked before about how wearing a mask can help you disidentify from your persona in a way that the mask kind of unmasks you. And, and Joseph, you had that great quote from Oscar Wilde on this. Can you uh, share that with us? Man is least himself. When he talks in his own person, give him a mask and he will tell the truth. Thank you. Uh, because I, I have a, an acquaintance who is a um, physician and he was saying that he actually loves wearing the mask because um, he doesn't have to monitor his facial expressions as carefully. He can just kind of be very uncensored because no one's going to see and and I think it's it's kind of just like yeah. that, you know. So it it affects how we function socially. It affects how we feel about ourselves, and it may be also affecting us at the level of the archetypal. That is really uh, interesting, and of of how that protects us. But it brought up for me how masks uh, can also perhaps feel really punitive. Of that I have to hide myself when I don't want to. There was a kind of mask in medieval times uh, that was worn as punishment. And it was a, a helmet, a metal helmet. Uh, it was called the, um, the scold's bridle. And the verb for it, I think, was branking. But it would be put over someone to silence them because there was a little tongue suppressor um, in this metal helmet that the person would wear. And I'm aware today of uh, feeling having to be distanced uh, in when I go to the grocery store or any other very ordinary kind of transaction that I do have that sense of uh, we are hidden from one another. We are defended against one another. Uh, and that it can be hard for me to hear someone wearing a mask. Our voices are muffled. I think many people are feeling punished, mm. unconsciously punished. Yeah. And in the government brings down these um, public health limitations, whether it's stay at home or businesses are closed. Rationally, we can understand there's some scientific ideas around it. But internally, I think people do feel punished. They feel punished by all the limits that have been laid upon them by this pandemic, not the least of which is, you know, being branked mm. by, you know, a surgical mask. Mm -hmm. And many of the people who are, who are activated against wearing it really use the language that you had brought forward, Deb, that this is a cruel and unusual punishment, and I simply cannot tolerate what this does to my psyche, or from a Jungian standpoint, what it evokes in the intrapsychic environment mm -hmm. is tolerable, or I believe yes. it is. Yeah. I think the branking is really right on it. People really do feel like the mask has become something that's silencing them, even silencing free speech. Mm -hmm. has been symbolized by being masked. And when these values start accreting around something like a little blue surgical mask, the intensity of the discourse gets very, very hot. Yeah. So I appreciate that we've been very careful to not, you know, weigh in on either side of the argument <laughs> um, with any particular prejudice. And I think what we're inviting the listeners to do is to ask themselves, you know, what are the symbolic values that have been laid upon the idea of wearing a, a COVID-related mask and how that is influencing your orientation towards that decision and to allow yourself to be informed around that. Shall we switch to a dream? Let's we should switch to a dream. Hi, 
This is Deb from this Jungian Life podcast. Joseph, Lisa, and I have been deeply moved by your response to our work, but producing, editing, and distributing it involves substantial expenses, and now we need your help. Please stop by our website, thisjungianlife.com, and click on the heading, Be Our Patron. You'll be redirected to our Patreon funding page. Patreon helps creators connect with people who believe in projects like ours. There, you can sign up with your credit card to support us for as little as a dollar a month. And at higher levels of support, we'll provide special episodes, behind-the-scenes photos and stories, and a chance to join a select pool of listeners for dream interpretations. Once again, please go to this jungianlife.com and click on Be Our Patron. Thank you. Today's dreamer is a 49-year-old woman who is a writer. And here's the dream. I am staying in a large Gothic house in the countryside while some sort of calamity is occurring in the world. I think it is a weather event as it is raining heavily outside. My adult daughter screams, summoning me to the foot of the imposing stairs where where she has seen a mouse scurrying. She is desperate that I catch it, and I do, holding it in my fist against my bare chest. I know it is terribly diseased and that the best thing would be for me to kill it, so I simply crush it. To my horror and disgust, foul liquid bursts out of the mouse. Now I have this horrible corpse to dispose of and I don't want my daughter or anyone else to see it. I can feel the sticky liquid on my bare skin. I find myself outside in the pouring rain. The rain is soaking me and now I have a large teddy bear in my arms. The corpse of the mouse is embedded in the teddy bear. As I walk, the bear becomes sodden, heavy, and cumbersome. I am looking for somewhere to dispose of it, but nowhere seems suitable. I wake feeling anxious. And here are the associations. I'm living through a turbulent time at the moment. My father died of COVID-19 about two months ago. My partner has also recently lost a parent. I am struggling to find the space and peace to write as my young adult children are living at home again during the pandemic. And the main feelings in the dream were anxiety, embarrassment, and shame. You know, there are times when the feeling that a dream evokes in any of us is so powerful uh, that it's worth paying attention to. And in the consulting room, I often think of myself sort of as a tuning fork, that I get the vibe or a vibe from a dream that I think is my reaction to the dreamer. And this dream makes me want to cry. Mm-hmm. I, I'm aware that the dreamer says anxiety, embarrassment, and shame were her main feelings. But I am feeling grief. That in the consulting room might be a useful thing to lift up for the dreamer because dreams are images of affect. And um, she says in her, in her context that there have been losses for herself and her partner, but also there is a death in this dream. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The mouse. It's an anguishing image. Yeah. My, my, um, Intuition on that, Deb, uh, jumping off from that, is the sh- there's shame and embarrassment about this mouse, and she wants to hide it, and she wants to hide it in this cute teddy bear, and uh, she doesn't want her daughter to see it. She wants to spare her daughter from it. And what is she trying to hide, and is it her grief? I wonder if it's also imaged in the rain. She starts out, uh, the situation is... It is raining heavily outside. And then after all this with the, with the mouse, she's outside in the pouring rain that is soaking her. And rain can evoke uh, the tears, the tears of the gods. 
the salutio, the floodwaters of where there is uh, affect coming down uh, in a torrential way. I understand that the you know the grief is natural, having lost a parent, of course, and the context of the pandemic can't be avoided. I find myself wanting to step a little bit further away from the dream and thinking about it as a purely intrapsychic transformation inside of her. Hmm. When we have a parent die, we have to integrate that we are no longer the child of anyone, or at least the child of that person. And there is something of the child position inside of us that has to be sacrificed, just naturally in order to take on another level of full existential responsibility for being an adult. So here, the adult daughter or the daughter inside her, the inner daughter, screams to see this tiny little mouse slash teddy bear and the tininess, childlikeness of it somehow evokes an enormous amount of fear. When she feels small and tiny and mouse-like in the true environment of the death of her own parent and under the weight of her responsibilities as an adult, that the little, tiny, regressive child inside of her becomes a kind of virus, becomes a problem in the psyche. For her to take it and crush it and put it in a teddy bear and to get rid of the teddy bear, to me, is the kind of heroic determination and indifference to suffering that one has to develop in a time of crisis. There's no room for behaving like a little sick mouse in this world, in her world. There's no way that I can fall apart when my adult children are depending on me. There's no way I can fall apart with the loss of my father or my father-in-law. All of that can't be tolerated anymore, and it needs to be put to rest. And a full, sober, adult stance is required in the face of all the things that I believe she's facing. And there is something very non-sentimental about how the dream ego is responding. That what needs to be done is just done. Yeah, you know, it would be best for me to kill it, and so I simply crush it. But then what happens next is that there's horror and disgust because of this foul liquid. Mm -hmm. So it's not simply over. There's horror and disgust, and it needs to be, she's trying to hide it, right? Am I? Let me just go back here and see. Yeah, she says, I have to dispose of it. I don't want my daughter or anyone else to see it. Yeah. So I have a feeling that there's some shame around her her grief or whatever it is that has been kind of lanced out of this situation. You know, I mean, sometimes when we lose a parent, there's also really complicated uh, feelings that come up too, unresolved stuff. And And although it did just need to be crushed, there's this sequela to it of this, this kind of foul liquid because it was diseased and there's this need to hide it. And, and I think kind of cloak it in over sent something that's overly sentimental. That's how I see the teddy bear. Mm -hmm. It's like, we're just going to kind of pretend everything's really squishy and, and warm and fuzzy when really something's like a, the, the mouse almost bursting open with this, it's like lancing a boil or something. Something has come out that was there and, and maybe it's a good thing that it's come out, but there's shame around it. I'm thinking about uh, what she crushes here is a mouse. Uh, so it takes me to what's, what's a mouse. And they are vermin, when you, f you find one in the house, they've been associated with disease, they scurry, they hide, uh, they're elusive, they, they're kind of margin, they exist in the margins or the twilights, they're not uh, kind of uh, daylight kinds of, of animals. And yet they can kind of gnaw and they're very hard to get rid of. Uh, people find mouse droppings in their drawers. 
So I'm thinking about the mouse as this elusive uh, kind of psychological scurrying content that seems to hide behind the baseboards, as it were, that she wants to just get rid of. Uh, and does so in such a gruesome way. Uh, I, that, that is a very vivid image in this dream. You know, in waking life, no one would be capable of doing that. I, I suspect, it, coming back to my thesis, which I think I'm aligned with, Deb, is I think it is a regressive childishness. I think there is something, when one recognizes one has been caught in childishness, particularly in the face of great demands, that the childishness, selfishness, scurryingness in the personality does feel shameful and does feel foul in a way and has to be put in. And I probably wouldn't have said it was the regressive childish part if it hadn't been put in the teddy bear. There's something about ah. the mouse and the teddy bear being brought together that makes me think it's something about being childish and not rising into a kind of objective adult, do what you have to do, even if it's gruesome strength that's required. You know, I, 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 I'm not sure I'm seeing it the same way you are, Joseph. <laughs> okay. I'm really interested in the role of the daughter. Okay. And, and I, w I wish I knew more about the daughter and the relationship with the daughter because the, the, this daughter is an adult and yet here she is screaming, you know, mom, come kill this mouse. You know, this, this, is, a, this is an adult. And the, and the dream ego does it. Yeah. You know, like I'm thinking, you know, hey, go kill your own mouse or whatever. You know, I mean, like, why is the mom rushing to kill the mouse for the for the adult daughter? So I'm wondering about that relationship and whether there isn't perhaps this dreamer has a very accommodating stance to perhaps her actual outer life daughter. Um, or perhaps it's kind of an inner dynamic, too, where she she needs to sort of. uh jump and just take care of every problem and make everything go away and make everything seem nice. And we don't really have a problem here. Instead, we have a big squishy teddy bear, you know, but she's also naked. She's, she's naked running around killing this mouse. And something about the daughter in this dream, both that it's the daughter who summons the dreamer to kill the mouse in this very kind of entitled way and then the t the paramount thing is I have to hide this from my daughter. So there's a real sense of wanting to coddle this adult daughter in a way that feels um, inappropriate to me. There's something there. Yeah, I'm pretty much on your track, Lisa, and that the cover-up is putting it in the teddy bear. Because uh, teddy bears are nice and they're warm and they're cute and they're fuzzy. And they are childish. And they are Joke, childish. Right. Um, it doesn't work uh, because the rain comes down and makes everything heavy and sodden. But the other feeling that I'm lifting up uh, that I think is here in the dream is um, that she crushes it. That there would be anger there. There would be like, okay, that's it. You know, I'll I'll go there and I'll kill it and I'll take this on. Yeah, there's a brutality. Exactly. Tremendous brutality uh, followed by disgust. And she says she's living through this difficult time. There have been two family losses, her father and father-in-law. And now um, her young adult children are at home again. And I wonder if some of these more sort of primordial feelings are having to be, at least from the dream ego's point of view, covered up. Well, she says she's struggling to find uh, room to write because of her young adult kids being home. And I wonder if it's a, l a little bit that she's overly accommodating towards them and she feels really, yeah. really angry about that. Yeah. But doesn't feel comfortable expressing it. Like maybe, like maybe doesn't feel like she mm -hmm. should get angry at them. So she has to hide it in a nice kind of warm, fuzzy teddy bear. And take it out on the mouse. Take that, <laughs> you little mouse. <laughs> well, and the mouse is also the part of herself that she thinks is foul and diseased. That she thinks, under the scrutiny of her adult children, the flaws of her personality are visible enough to cause a scream of horror from one of her children. And a lot of times, you know, when we're 
you know, just living with our partner or perhaps living alone, you know, the things that we don't like about ourselves or the things that are legitimately underdeveloped can stay pretty quiet. When all of a sudden you've got a bunch of people that know you very well or interacting with you all the time and perhaps even conflicting with you all the time, you know, personality flaws, undeveloped things start getting really shamefully clear. The ability to take something that's shameful and to squeeze the life out of it with the kind of heroic determination reminds me a little bit of a scene in Iron John which is another tale about a a boy becoming a man. And in one of the early scenes, the boy is with his dog walking around a lake. And inside the lake, unbeknownst to him, is this ancient man, Iron John. And the dog comes to the edge of the lake, and Iron John reaches out, grabs the dog, and drowns it in the lake, and ostensibly consumes it. And the boy does not weep, which is the first initiation. That something has to be sacrificed in this maturational process, which involves her containing a lot of very, very intense feelings. And at some point, she doesn't know where to dispose it. She doesn't know what's suitable. She may not have been, you know, access to an analyst, let's say, at that moment, but she's carrying the fact that she had to crush or decided to crush something foul in herself. Mm -hmm. That's horrifying to one of her children. Yeah. Sounds like Mm self-development in a kind of raw way. I I don't know. I I know. know. It's great. We all see (laughs) it differently. That's part of the beauty of it all. (laughs) Uh, I am interested in the fact that she says in the dream that this mouse is diseased. I know it is terribly diseased. And I'm thinking, you know, mice are kind of, they're really archetypal and symbolic, as most animals are in our psyche. Uh, We have very powerful associations, and certainly to mice. But on the plus side, you know, what if it had been a healthy mouse? And where's the healthy mouse in her that is nimble uh, and prolific. Mice are famously prolific in uh, breeding offspring. And they've been portrayed in fairy tales as, you know, like this movie of Cinderella, they sew her gown, uh, that they are clever and sensitive to the intricate workings of things. I remember I got my daughter a, a mouse house. It was a riff on a doll house uh, with little um toy mice who lived in this sort of tree stump dollhouse kind of thing. I'm curious about whether her inner mouse, does she have a healthy one, one that can uh, work at the edges? She's a writer. And that kind of energy might be might be useful, but we only see mouse in its negative aspect. Yeah. In I mean, in, right. And in, in fairy tales and myths, sometimes a mouse or mice can nibble away at the answer, at a problem, and yes. find an answer. So it's a kind of problem-solving, mm-hmm. uh, a, a sort of almost unconscious function of the psyche yeah. to nibble away at a problem until it gives way. Well, in any case, we think she's having a pretty intense experience. Yeah, and, and yeah. we're really sorry to hear about yeah. her recent losses. Yeah, very real losses that are casting you upon yourself for some solution. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living This Jungian Life.